Good morning and welcome to our worship today. Welcome to visitors who are with us this morning. It's good to see uh, Kevin here this morning. We were talking to him earlier and it's nice to see him here so through from uh, Court Dyke. He's on a, on a holiday break. And uh, also welcome to those watching online as well as in the sanctuary here. There's tea and coffee through in the hall afterwards. Uh, you're very welcome to come and join us there. Thank you to the social committee for organising and catering for the senior treat yesterday. It was a lovely afternoon and uh, thoroughly enjoyed by everyone there, including me. The latest issue of the Congregational Magazine is now available for, on the stage for visitors to uplift. Uh, and the prayer group meets on Wednesday afternoon at one o'clock in the prayer room. If you'd like to come along, you'll be most welcome. I note also later this week we're hosting Kip Keswick in Motherwell from Thursday the 12th to Saturday the 14th of this month, 7.30 in the sanctuary. Jonathan Lamb is preaching on the book of Jeremiah and worship will be led by Ian Watson of Praise Gathering. Please come along and join these wonderful evenings. Conventions are a great time uh, to, to join with people from other churches, to worship together and also to hear. Jonathan Lamb is a wonderful speaker. He's got a lot to say. I've heard him uh, several times. He's a, he's a great preacher. So uh, if you can get along Thursday to Saturday, any of those evenings this week, then I'd encourage you uh, to do that. Your word, O Lord, is eternal, says the psalmist. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. Let's worship God together. We sing our first hymn, Christ triumphant, ever reigning. join together in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, the God who created the whole universe, the God who has power beyond all our understanding and beyond measure, 
We come this morning to worship you, for you are a great and a wonderful God. We come to worship you as we come away from the busyness and all the distractions of our, of our ordinary lives. We come here to be in your presence, to remind ourselves once again of what is important, not just in our lives, but in our world. And we pray, Lord, that as we come to you, we might be aware in a new way of how great you are and what you are like and how much you care for us and love us. Help us to understand again the, the wonder of your mercy and your grace, but also the power of your holiness and your truth. Lord, you are a God who upholds all things by your mighty word. You are the one who has come to us in our need, in your Son, Jesus Christ. You have come to be with us. You have come to draw us to yourself. And as we've been singing in his birth and life and death and resurrection, in his ascension to the right hand of God, this is the one in whose name we come to you, in whose name we come to worship. For we can come not in any strength of our own, for we are weak, not in any goodness of our own, because we are sinful people. But we come in Jesus' name, because he has died for us, to cleanse us and forgive us, and to make us right with you, Lord, so that we can stand in your presence and no one can bid us thence depart. Lord, we give you thanks for the wonder of your grace towards us. And Lord, we confess that we go wrong in so many ways. So often we make ourselves the center of our own world and we forget other people and we forget you. And Lord, when we do that, we start to think and do and say things that are, are not the right things to do and say and think. And we remember that your ways are as high as the heavens above our ways, that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And we realize how we've gone wrong. And Lord, we ask you to forgive us, but that is not a vain request because we know that when we come in faith, when we seek that forgiveness, we know that Jesus died for that very reason so that we can know cleansing and renewal and that we can stand uncondemned in your sight, in your presence. Lord, these are wonderful things to know and we thank you for them. And we pray that as you know our hearts today with all our circumstances, all our anxieties, all the burdens that we bear, Lord, as you know all these things about us, we ask that you would speak to our hearts, that you'd open your word and by your spirit speak to us so that we might know that you're a God who knows everything about us and would bless us in everything we do in your name. So Lord, we ask these things, our morning prayer, we bring these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Let's sing again now. It's another hymn that goes through the, the life of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection for us, and it reminds us of this gospel that we have to proclaim, and that's the first line. We have a gospel to proclaim.
reading today is from Psalm 145, verses 1 to 7. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. And our second scripture reading is from Paul's letter to 2 Timothy, chapter 1, starting from verse 8. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who, was who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the Gospel. And of this Gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher that is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me keep as a pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Amen. May God add a blessing to the readings from his holy word. Let's sing again. Now, this hymn is a prayer to ask God to help us to understand his word as we come to it shortly. So let's sing, Look Upon Us, Blessed Lord.
I went to look for a copy of Life and Work uh, this morning or sometime before just now anyway because I wanted to check on something. Um, I don't know whether they tell you about the legacies in Life and Work these days. They certainly used to. Uh, perhaps some of you know about that better than, than I do. Uh, but I got the impression at one time they stopped actually telling you when people left legacies to the church, or at least publishing it in Life and Work. Uh, maybe it's because uh, nobody leaves anything anymore, although I doubt that. Or maybe because the church doesn't want you to know these vast amounts that people are leaving in case you think, well, I don't need to give as much these days. I don't know. But what would you like to leave to the church if you could? And I don't mean money, although that's obviously very helpful. And uh, Thinking particularly of our own day, what would you want to leave to the church in a difficult time? even in a time of crisis. And we might think, well, what crisis? But in many ways, we'd be looking the wrong way or not looking at all if we didn't realize there is crisis in our church today. Money might not be the answer. After all, you can't buy faith. You can't buy commitment and loyalty. Nor can you buy courage, which is what we need a lot of today as well in the church. These are the things that we need. Money to improve and maintain church buildings is very useful and very generous too when people do leave it. But there's no, one, no use um, looking after a building if people are not coming to it at all. I think that's pretty clear. But perhaps you'd like to leave new ideas. Perhaps you'd like to leave imaginative and creative ideas uh, for new projects to attract the young or to attract the old for that matter. New ways of being church, to use the, the jargon that we hear of sometimes. Or in a church in crisis, perhaps some would want to leave the principles of church without walls, traveling light with Jesus, as it is put. That's a great idea, and I quite like that one. It sounds like doing away with all the unnecessary baggage that the church carries around with it. Unnecessary baggage, but yet seems to be things that we need, committees and administration and buildings yet again, meetings, and, and so on. Perhaps that's what we'd like to leave, something about traveling light, focusing on what matters. The trouble is that that could mean different things to different people. It might mean to some people, it might mean actually ditching important things, like the biblical picture of Jesus for one that we felt was more suited to today's world, whatever that might be. So what would we want to leave to the church if we could? Well, that was a question that faced Paul in prison as he wrote to Timothy in this his second and last letter where the question was very real. What really mattered? And we might think, well, in Timothy's day, in Paul's day, in New Testament times, the church wasn't in crisis, was it? The church was perfect. After all, it's in the Bible and if it's in the Bible, it must have been perfect. Well, the indications are that in many ways, the churches in the New Testament times were far from perfect. And they weren't very strong sometimes, especially in the place where Timothy was at that time when Paul wrote to him. And if you've got your Bibles with you, you can look at verse 15, where it tells us, it says, you know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus, and homogenies, and I apologize for putting words like that in someone and asked to read those out. It's, uh, it's not a pretty difficult one. And then there was a Nesiphorus later on as well, so um, I'll try not to do that, but sometimes it's there, isn't it? Well, anyway, Paul was put in prison, and so many fellow Christians had fled, and they'd given up through fear of imprisonment and more. Or they were ashamed to be associated with him because he was in prison. We don't know anything about these two people, Phagellus and Hermogenes, but they stand out as if they were the ones that Paul would have expected to have stayed with him, but even they deserted him. So if even they deserted him, then probably lots of other people did too. And it seems that the church was in real trouble, with little confidence and few people prepared to stick their neck out. Their heads were very firmly down. So where was loyalty? Where was commitment? Where was faith? Where was courage? 
Well, it was there from some, like Onesiphorus, for example, in the very next verse, and it tells us that he went out of his way to look for Paul and to find him. And he was a real help to Paul. But many of them weren't, his fellow believers. So there was a need for faith and there was a need for other things too, as there is in the church today. So what could Paul leave as he faced death every day? What did he value? What does it say to us about what we value and what we should value? Well, we find the answer in this passage we read this morning, and especially from verses 13 to chapter 2, verse 2, which is all about entrusting things. We finished last week thinking about what Paul had entrusted to God, and he says, I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. It's a a wonderful verse. And if a believer can say that, it's a wonderful thing. I know him, I believe, and I know that he's able to keep what I have entrusted to him against or until that day. He knew that things were safe with Christ. But he goes on from then to talk about entrusting something to Timothy, and in turn, Timothy entrusting something to other people. So what Paul gives to Timothy, Timothy is to give to others, and they are to pass on. So it's about a succession. And here is what Paul leaves in verse 13 and 14. He says, what you've heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. It speaks about a pattern of sound teaching, and it speaks about a good deposit. And it's the same thing described in two ways. What is that but the gospel preached and taught by the apostles, the ones commissioned by Jesus Christ himself to do that? Before his ascension, Jesus told his disciples to go into all the world, baptizing and teaching all the nations. Not just saying, come to Jesus and everything will be all right. Come to Jesus and then you don't need anything more. But teaching them also. So that they were in a position to make an informed decision with mind and heart, with thought and with passion. And then they would confess that faith and be baptized. In other words, they do this in public. And you don't do a thing like that in public unless you really want to. You don't profess your faith in front of other people unless it's important to you, unless you've thought it through and counted the cost. And you do that on the basis of this pattern of teaching. And the indications are that the teaching of the apostles had a definite pattern or an outline. There was all kinds of coming and going within that, but there was this outline. And we saw something earlier of of that earlier last week in in this very chapter in verses 9 and 10, when Paul talks about this grace being revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light in the gospel. About a God who has saved us not because of anything in ourselves, but because of grace. Grace that came when Jesus Christ appeared in history, in time and space. He appeared in particular at Bethlehem and died at a particular time outside Jerusalem. And by his death, he drew the sting of death. And by his resurrection, he brought life and immortality to light. In other words, it was the good news of Christ's death and resurrection and the grace of God that brings us life. So we see it there in in this very letter we're reading. But we see it also in, in, for instance, Romans chapter 10 at verse 9, where Paul says, If we confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, then we will be saved. Because you see, to say Jesus is Lord in the Roman Empire was no light thing. As far as the Roman Empire was concerned, Caesar was the Lord, and the Christians came along and said, no, Jesus is Lord, and that could have been considered an act of treason. So that too was in the outline, in the pattern. Or if we look at 1 Corinthians 15, and it's, it's quite interesting to look at this one, because it talks about what's of first importance. 
He says, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel because we forget so easily. The gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. What I received, I passed on to you. You see this, this language of succession, of passing things on. Paul received this from Jesus himself. And he says, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So it's taken in the Old, Old Testament here as well. It, Paul didn't have our New Testament. When he's talking about according to the Scriptures, he's talking about according to what we call the Old Testament. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, again, according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the Twelve. So he goes on in that mighty chapter in 1 Corinthians 15 to speak of all the implications of that resurrection for forgiveness, for Christ's place in the church and in the world. Or again, we could look at Philippians 2. I won't go into that just now, but in Philippians 2 where it talks about Christ uh, coming from heaven and coming down as a servant, going to death on the cross and being exalted through the, after his death, after the cross to the right hand of God, so that everyone bows and confesses that Jesus is Lord. That is a pattern of teaching that we find all through. Jesus is Lord again, as we saw in Romans 10. And if we put all those things together with, say, Peter's preaching at Pentecost, if you remember that, we get an idea of the pattern of sound teaching. And you remember how Peter in his uh, preaching at Pentecost began with the book of Joel, a prophecy with the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures. And if you put all that together, the Old Testament, the New, the preaching, the pattern of teaching, what we find is this. We find the apostles and the New Testament coming to us and they want us to know and to understand and to learn about Christ, who he is, why he came, and what he expects from us. That's a familiar thing. We were looking at that earlier on this year. And you could summarize the whole, the whole of the Scriptures in that way. This is what they're concerned about. This is what we need to know. Who Christ is, why Christ came, and what Christ expects from us. And that's what Paul wanted to leave to his beleaguered church. And that's what was of importance, of first importance to him, and therefore should also be important to Timothy. So what's of first importance to you this morning? What's of first importance to me? Is it this good deposit passed on down the years? Is it this apostolic teaching that we still have guarded and kept for us in our Bibles by the church and by faithful people down the years. Or is that all a bit boring? Do we think, well, we've heard all that before. Is this, do we think, not innovative enough for us? Do we not wish we could go on to something different? Well, there are those in our church today, the church nationally I'm thinking of, who think that. They see that those who want to guard the apostles' teaching, they see them as living in the past. They see them as those, and I've heard this so often from people in, in various committees and conferences and things in the Church of Scotland, people who think that people who want that pattern of teaching and to stay with that, they say that those sort of people just want things neatly packaged. They say it's not possible to be certain about our faith, that we're afraid to venture out into new paths, or that we're not open to new ideas and new thinking, which usually turns out to be, when you follow it through, turns out to be a new faith altogether because it's no longer the apostles' teaching. Now let me say, there's no doubt that some of us are, or could well be, stuck in the past. There are those of us who could well be afraid of new ideas, Change is not something that most of us do quickly or lightly. But you know, it's a travesty to speak of wanting things neatly packaged or that there can be no certainties. To be sure, life is full of uncertainties. We all have our doubts about things at different times. We all wonder what on earth is going on in my life at the moment. What on earth is going on in the world what on earth is going on in our country at the moment? We all have those. There are uncertainties around us. 
But unless you do away with God altogether, then we have to say, there are things he has given us and revealed to us and promised to us, and what God has revealed we cannot just dismiss. Things like the deity of his own son, Jesus, and therefore the authority of what he says. Things like his death and resurrection for our sins and the promise. And we have to say the certainty, the certainty of God's forgiveness. Now, I may well doubt that sometimes. If I'm having a hard day, if I'm going through a difficult time, if I've done something for the 101st time that I've done that thing before, then I might wonder, how on earth can God forgive me for this? But you know, there is no doubt, according to what God tells us, that Christ died to forgive my sins, all of them and every one of them, over and over again, if need be. And if that's not true, then why do we bother? And the worst than that is just despair. This is not a neat package. It's simply the pattern of sound teaching. The framework that helps me know where I am in an otherwise meaningless universe. This is where I get my bearings in a lost world. Because Jesus is the good shepherd of the lost sheep. And I, I don't mind telling you, I am a lost sheep. And I need a shepherd. I need guidance. I need to know where the North Star is. We all do. And God wants us to be sure of these things because there are mysteries enough as it is. There are enough situations in the world and in my own life that will not be neatly packaged. There are enough uncertainties in an unpredictable world and God knows that. And that's why he gave us Jesus and the gospel and this framework so that we don't lose our bearings. And in all the chaos of 21st century life, There is a cross. There is a Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And we have the Bible, which is where we have the apostles' teaching of how that cross and resurrection work out. And it's explained and it's interpreted so that with some hard work, yes, and some prayer, I can work this out in my own life. And I think that's where the trouble lies. When many people want innovation, when they want something other than this pattern of sound teaching that Paul speaks of, what they don't want is the challenge of the straightforward teaching of Jesus and his apostles, or the challenge of thinking out things that they don't like. When it's easier to make something say what they want it to say, rather than struggle with what the text actually says. And they want to dismiss unpalatable things. Or maybe they've just heard it all before and they've decided it's boring and it's old hat. But for anyone who's prepared to let God speak to them, it's not like that. It's forever new because we ourselves are always changing. That's a benefit. I mentioned the Keswick ministry uh, in Motherwell, the the conference in uh, convention in, in the church here this week. The benefit of of conventions like that is that it refreshes things. It helps you to think and see things a different way. That you you go to church on a Sunday, Sunday by Sunday, and that's like your daily bread, as it were. But the convention's like a a, a wonderful piece of uh, Victoria sponge or something, or it's trifle, whatever you... The most delicious thing you like eating as opposed to daily bread, that's what a convention's about. And it's a wonderful thing. And that's its use in some ways. But, you know, things do become fresher to us and newer to us. When you're a good Samaritan, when you read the good Samaritan in Sunday school, it means something to you. But it's different in the workplace. Or when you've got a a house full of children running about or something. Then you think differently about the good Samaritan. It comes to you a different way. What I think about my need of forgiveness changes with what I've actually done this past week. And now I'm dealing with that. What I believe about resurrection depends on how closely death has touched my life. And there are real challenges there. The circumstances are different, but the teaching is the same. And there will continue to be so from this gener- that will continue to be so from this generation to the next as Psalm 145 was saying 
And those who follow us in the church, however stripped down that church may be, however weak that church may be, will have the same challenges and the same need of the same gospel because some things don't change. And that's why Timothy was told in chapter 2, verse 2, not just to guard this gospel, but to entrust this teaching to others, to reliable people who will be qualified to teach, to those who are faithful, who have the commitment and the courage. Now, it's the pastor's job, not just to preach and teach, but to, to pass on the teaching. And it has come to them, so it is to go to others. For it is something entrusted, it's something precious, it's something of vital importance. It's this good deposit. And that's part of the, the church's task, and we could say it's part of the ordained minister's task. But there's a, a wider application than that. How do the folk in the pews pass on this teaching? Is it just me as the professional, which is not a very good word for it, I don't think, but is it just for the professional who's supposed to do it? I suppose technically that's true. The minister has the task of entrusting it, and the church the task of ordaining people to do that, but it works in a less formal way too. Through Bible studies, for instance, where people learn together, and as they do learn together, they learn to value what they learn, and they come to understand something in a way that they didn't before, just how important this is. This is actually, they realize, of first importance. But it's also something that should be passed on to someone else in other ways. In the Sunday school, that's getting passed on all the time. In, in midweek clubs, in messy church, in the boys and the girls' brigade, in the family, to children and to grandchildren, to nephews and nieces. But we won't pass it on unless we value it and guard it, unless it's important to us. We pass on heirlooms, maybe your grandmother's wedding ring, a watch, war medals perhaps, all sorts of things, because they're important to us. And so we need to learn to value this book and the teaching that we can receive from it. Something that has been passed on to us, and don't forget, something that's been passed on to us at great cost. Right from the early days of the church through trials and persecution, right through in our own church, the times of Reformation and the Covenanters, we must not take it for granted. And the day may yet come when it won't be that easy to get a Bible. You don't take the Bible for granted if you live in Eastern Europe, for instance. And when we do value it, we want to pass it on. And not only that, we want to guard it. Timothy is told to guard the good deposit entrusted to him. Go back to that idea of the heirloom. You may have your grandmother's wedding ring, and you want to entrust it someday to your own daughter or perhaps your own granddaughter. But for now, you keep it safe, and you look after it, and you make sure it's not stolen or lost. And it's the same with the gospel. This precious thing passed down through the years, we're not going to let it be lost, we're not going to let it be stolen. It may not be prison or threats that affect us, but it may be the threat or the weary onslaught of a secular society or, or the apathy of the world where, uh, with the scorn and the disdain in which Christ is held today, where no one seems to see the gospel as the important thing that we do. It may be the thing that we struggle with is a national church that seems to compromise at every turn, and yet this church that we love, that we are part of, and that's a painful thing. Whatever, we have to guard this teaching in whatever environment we find ourselves to value it, to learn it, absorb it. And that's not easy. That it's something that has been passed on from Paul's instruction here all those years ago. That's the reason that we have it today. How important is this to you this morning? And we end as we began. What do you want to leave to the church? May God bless us and help us to work these things out in our day-by-day 
ordinary and sometimes not so ordinary lives. Amen. Let's uh, continue our worship now as we take up our offering for the work of God in this place. Before we turn to prayer, could I just say that uh, the General Assembly uh, asked for a season of prayer at this time of the year, and Presbytery on Tuesday night there had a time of of prayer at that time, so I think it'd be good for us in our prayers later just to remember our church uh, in this time especially. So let's pray together. Oh, gracious God, we give you thanks for every blessing of our daily lives. Thank you for family and friendship and fellowship that we share together. Thank you for all that you've given us in Jesus, your Son. And as we bring these offerings, we pray that you would accept them and use them in the service of your kingdom, for Jesus' sake. And Lord, we pray for our church today. We pray for the church often, but particularly at this time. And as we've been thinking about what Paul said in his letter to Timothy, we Pray for all these good traditions, things handed down in our churches. And of course the gospel of the coming and the life and death, the resurrection and ascension, the coming again of our Lord Jesus. And we thank you for faithful people who have passed that message on down the years. Those who have worked hard and often against uh, opposition or in difficult circumstances down the centuries. 
Lord, especially in this, our own congregation, we thank you for those who have uh, worked for that gospel over the years and those who are no longer with us, those who are with us today, those we give thanks for and remember with great love and affection. Well, we pray for the church to guard that deposit and to value it. And Lord, in he, this church we pray for our elders and congregational board, for those who lead the youth organisations and the guild and the sisterhood and the men's club, for the outreach in Messy Church, the community breakfast and reach out itself. Lord, we pray for interim moderator Murdo. I pray, Lord, for your hand upon him in his busy life, in his two congregations in Blantyre and in his responsibilities here. Lord, watch over him and strengthen him and, and, and give him all that he needs for that work. We pray for the nominating committee. We pray, Lord, your hand upon them uh, and all that they do. And we pray for the vacancy here that in due time, you bring the person of your choice, the person to, to be the minister in this place. Your hand would be working upon that situation. And Lord, we remember the vacancies across the Church of Scotland today. And Lord, we pray for the needs of this place. Those who are sick, those who know loss and different kinds of pain, that you would bring healing and comfort and strength and patience and reassurance of the love of God and all that the gospel of Christ is able to give from the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. So Lord, we pray for all these things, for our church nationally, our church here, for those we know and love, for those we care about and are burdened for, and we bring our prayers, all of them, in Jesus' name. Amen. Nice to see you here. Good to have you here. Before we find out what you've been doing, we're going to sing a song um, called Lord I Pray. If today, can we have the song up on the screen? Because I've forgotten the words. <laughs> Coming up in a minute, the song. We haven't, you won't have sung it before, I'm pretty sure. Probably nobody in the church has sung it before. But it's very simple. I always say that. Very simple, easy to learn. And uh, we're going to sing it just as soon as it comes. There we go. So you read that, Lord, I pray if today someone wrongs or troubles me, make me kind, bring to mind that forgiveness makes us free. It's only three verses and that's how long a verse is. Now, the choir are going to sing it first. They're going to sing through the first verse. Then when they finish singing the first verse, we'll stand up and we'll sing it all together from verse one, two, and three. Okay, so the choir are going to sing the first verse first. So we know what to do, and then we'll sing it together. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
of time, and we have another time, it'll be that bit easier for you to see it. Now, what we're doing in Sunday school today, drawing a picture of something. Thank you, God, for okay. What were you talking about today? We were drawing a picture of what you thank God for. A picture of what you thank God for. Okay. Anything else about? Yeah, okay. We were blowing up balloons while we were saying the Lord's Prayer and we were also writing down um, our praises, like right. what we thank God for. So you're, throwing, you're blowing up balloons to say what you thank God for. Okay, anything else? This is intriguing. Yeah, anything else that people do? So what were you thanking God for? What were you thanking God for? Did you not have anything to thank God for? Was that kind of hard? Somebody right there back there, come on then. What were you thanking God for? Lidwell Primary School. You were thanking God for your primary school? That's good. Glad to hear that, yeah? Were you thanking God for school? No. No. A troll! Hey? A troll. Uh-oh. Josh, you picked a better thing than that to thank God for. So, so I'm told. Your brother, yes. Sure, that's more interesting. Yep. Yep, go on, anything else? For my birthday. For your birthday, is that today? Tomorrow. Oh, yeah. oh, yes, yesterday. <laughs> was it yesterday or tomorrow? Yes. It was yesterday. And how old were you? Seven. Seven. Happy birthday, well done. Anybody else thanking God for things? Yeah. Thank you, God, for making teddy bears. For making teddy bears, yeah, that's a really good thing. Anything else? Thank you, God, for making animals. For making animals, right, okay, yeah. Family. Family, yeah, come on, one more. Thank you, God, for helping my mummy. For helping your mummy, that's... Don't you help your mummy? Do you help your mummy? Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Somebody down here, then I think. Yeah. The internet. Sorry? The internet. The internet, thank you, God, for the internet, well... And was there any... Was there any Bible story involved here that anything to trigger this off, this thanking God for anything? No? We're just thanking God for all these different things. Well, that, that's going. Thank you, God, for forgiving all our sins. Thank you, God, for forgiving all our sins. Yeah, that's right. There's all sorts of things to say thank you to God for. You know, that is, that is good news. Has anybody had any good news this week? Anybody had any good news? What about Scotland the other night there? Is that not good news? They lost, didn't they? That was bad news. What about England playing the cricket today? That's not good news either, is it? Anybody, anybody bother with cricket in this congregation? Nobody's the slightest bit interested. Well, I am. And I'm heartbroken. There we go. Maybe you have a good news about maybe you have good news about a friend. Maybe maybe a friend's coming for a sleepover or something. And you'd be glad about that? Or maybe some good news? Yeah, okay. See if you have some good news here. Having a play date at my house. Having a? Play date. A play date at your house, that's good news, isn't it? Have you got one coming up? Yes, another thing happened yesterday. Yeah, good, good. I'm glad there's been good things happening. Go on then. The medal at my gymnastics competition. Say that again. I won the medal at my, gym, my gymnastics competition. You won a medal at a gymnastics competition. Isn't that wonderful? That's great. And you seven yesterday as well. What, lots of good things happening to you. I don't think I manage with all this. Come on then. Winning two medals at my gymnastics competition. <laughs> you won two medals at your gymnastics competition. Well done. Well, I won three. Yes. Yeah, that'd be right. Yeah. Somebody in the back here hasn't said anything yet, and then, yeah, go on. I went to a bingo night on Friday. Was that good news? A bingo night on Friday, okay. Okay, okay. You know, you know, once when Jesus was around, when they talked about good news, have you heard this word gospel? Do you know the word gospel? That means good news. And in Jesus' time, when there was a new emperor on the throne, they didn't have any internet to say thank you for. 
They didn't even have telephones or anything like that. They used to send people all around the empire and they used to say, Caesar, there is a new emperor and he is now the king and this is a cause for great rejoicing. And that's what they did. So when the church came along, they said, we have good news. A new, there is a new king and it's not Caesar who's the new king. It's not the Roman Empire. He says, the new king is Jesus and that is the good news. And we thank God for all these things you've been saying. We thank God for the good news that Jesus is the King. And that's what we need to really remember and think about every day. Jesus is the King. That means he knows all about your life. He's in control of things. And sometimes when you think it's hard going, he's there and he knows all about us and he's able to look after us. So let's remember that. And thank you for, uh, thank you for telling me all your news this morning, that's been really good. Now we're going to finish by singing a great song, a hymn, it's called, O Church, Arise and Put Your Armour On. So let's sing that together now, O Church, Arise. <laughs> has no limit, whose grace has no measure, whose power has no boundary be with you. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.